We're going to talk about setting cash rental rates. This is the one question I always get. And if you asked me this question within the last two weeks, I would have just told you to sign up for this meeting because I don't <laughs> like having to explain this. I should probably make some videos on YouTube and just tell people to go watch them. Um, whatever way you arrive at the cash rent, it has to be a rate that's going to work for both parties involved. I use the word viable, I used to word that, use the word equitable, I don't really like that one. Alan uses a four-lettered F word of fair, right? Fair is a four-lettered F word, it's a sense of judgment. What you think is fair versus what I think is fair is two different things. You know, it's influenced by many, many different things. Viable, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says something about you're trying to work on something, you're trying to do something that's going to work for both parties involved. Now, there are different ways to figure this out. Three different approaches or three different ideas on how to set cash rental rates are up on the screen right now. You can take regional, county or regional cash rent information and adjust it down to the farm level. You can also do this thing called cash equivalent from crop share or hay share. You take a crop share and make it into a cash rental rate. I know there's at least one person that stopped me before I started today um, in a state situation and they're trying to take custom farming and moving it into a cash rent. This would be a good example for them. Final example, land is an investment. Every investment has a return. If you know what it's worth and times it by a rate of return, that could be a cash rental rate. The third example is a little more tricky. and We tend to see people like bankers, sometimes when they have a pretty good pulse on the area, they might do that kind of thing. So the first example here, I have a made up county and in my made up county, the average cash rental rate is $190 per acre. It's in the upper left hand corner on this table. Now, we take that 190 bushel, or excuse me, $190, and typically in this county, we raise about 134 bushel. If you take $190 and divide it by 134 bushel per acre, that's typically what the county raises. You can get that number from like a crop insurance agent, for example. You divide the two together, you get what is called the county rent per bushel. What that says uh, in this made up example, $1.42 of the sale price is going towards what? It's going towards the cash rent per bushel, okay? So if you get $5.50 a bushel on rented ground in this county, $1.42 is going towards the cash rent. Is a buck 42 a lot if you're getting five and a half or six and a half dollars a bushel? No, that's not too bad. What about if you're getting 280 when it was COVID about two years ago? Is that a lot? You betcha. So you just gotta always, when you start playing with numbers, always ask, you gotta step back and ask yourself, what is reasonable? That's one way to look at it. Now, if we take the county rent per bushel, $1.42, <laughs> slide it to the upper right hand corner, and on this case, we have a situation where our farm, the APH, that's a number associated with the crop insurance records. What does the property typically raise over the last 10 years? It's the actual production history. If you take the APH and multiply it by the county rent per bushel, that gives us what? It gives us a farm level rent. We take what we didn't know. We didn't know what the county rental rate was or excuse me, we didn't know what the farm rental rate was, but we did know what the county, the county numbers were. We take what we know and we apply it to what we do not know, okay? Now under this example, this farm is only 119 bushel, the county is 134. Believe it or not, there are farms that actually raise less than the county average, right? <laughs> but if you had a case where it was 145, you would adjust that cash rental rate from 190 bush, or excuse me, $190 per acre to something a little bit higher. You'd, you take what we know at the region, we back it down to the farm, all right? The key thing here is you gotta figure out what the county corn yield is or the county soybean or wheat or whatever your crop is. 
The best place I've found is talking to crop insurance agents is one easy way to find that. There's a lot of crop insurance agents across the state. Now the second idea, if we recall right when Alan got done this morning, he talked about crop shares. It's fairly typical under a 50-50 split, half of the seed, fertilizer, and chemical expenses are split down the middle on dryland cropland. Irrigation and you got other stuff, but we're just gonna keep it simple. So what I did, uh, this field doesn't yield 70 bushel, it actually yields 140. I went on the University of Nebraska's website, Glennis McClure does our crop budgets, and with her crop budget, I picked a budget where I pulled out half of the seed, fertilizer, and chemical expenses, okay? I figured out to about 185 an acre. Half of that's being paid by the landlord, half is being paid by the tenant. Now, in addition to that, I use the planting time price guarantee here in March. I got three scenarios, March, July, and November. I was told not to stand in front of the screen, so that's why we're getting the clicker out. But in March right here, if the landlord gets half the crop, 70 bushel goes to the landlord, 70 to the tenant. I use the planting time price guarantee, or I think, you know, if I look at the futures prices, I figure the crop's gonna be worth about 590 a bushel. 70 times 590 gives me the landlord's share of the income minus a landlord's share of the expenses. If everything played out perfectly in this scenario, the landlord would make about 228 an acre. Now they still have to pay real estate taxes. Landlords still have to pay real estate taxes if they're on cash rents, right? If you're a tenant in the crowd today and somebody's asking you, well, what do you wanna offer for cash rent? Can you work backwards through this and say, okay, if I'm gonna offer them 220 or 230 or 200 an acre, maybe your expenses are a little bit higher, whatever. I do feel the university's budgets when they did them the input expenses could have been a little bit higher, but they did them about oh, October of 2021 before things really took off. So this is the first case. Second case we get to is July. Now I hold the crop yield constant. I don't play around with that. But we get to July and we think that corn price is up about uh, 30 or 40 cents. Not quite 6.30 a bushel. Expenses, the three expenses we're dealing with here, those are fairly well locked down if you prepay them in the spring, right? So under this case, uh, $254 an acre, that is what the landlord thinks they're gonna make if prices are higher, right? Now the final case right here, we get to harvest, prices, maybe things are a little bit better nationally, prices back down. And uh, we see here the case is, is 214 an acre. Now out of March, July, and November, which is the fair cash rental rate? Well, if you're it's a landlord, it's July, right? And if you're a tenant, it's a far right. <laughs> I would say the fair cash rent, or what Alan is trying to get at with that word, what did you actually sell it for? What was the actual yield? And also, what were the input expenses? Everything varies based off of this. Now, I joked when we went through the cash rents, I said, if you can tell me the fertilizer, or what I really should have said was input expenses and the corn prices, I'll tell you what the cash rent should be because you can work through this. You get to plug in your own numbers, but it's just a very basic idea. So the opportunity value on doing a crop share is cash rent. So if somebody offers you 215 an acre, is it a good idea? Well, maybe they got some higher expenses than what we have up here, right? So if somebody, you know, is, when you talk about cash rents, it's always like playing poker. Who wants to show their cards first? What do you want? Well, what do you think is fair? I don't know, what do you think is fair? Well, if you could pull out a basic example like this, I think that's one way to kind of square stuff up. You can build off, you can take off, add more on, whatever. And the other case, uh, who has hay land? Anyone? Some grass to cut for hay? few people. Okay, I always get the question, somebody's got, you know, 15, 20 acres of land, and with that land they are struggling on how to set the cash rental rate. Cash equivalent from hay share. This is just to reinforce the prior slide. So instead, of, we have two situations here. We could do a one-third, two-thirds split in the center, 
or on the far right we could do a 50-50 split. Now in this made up example the field actually yielded two and a half tons of hay per acre. It actually rained. Well under the one-third, two-third split the landlord gets a third of the hay and because in this example they don't pay any of the input expenses their income, if the tenant would say, I'll buy your sh share of the hay out from you, the cash equivalent from hay share, the opportunity value on selling that hay, not quite 100 bucks per acre. You might say, well, $120 per ton is too high. Plug in the number you want, whatever. Maybe it's alfalfa, maybe it's 200. Maybe it should only be one ton per acre. It's one way to figure out the cash rent when you have irregularly shaped pieces or you're unsure on what the property yields. And under this 50-50 split, uh, two and a half tons per acre, landlord gets half, the tenant gets half. Now under this case, the landlord wants a little bit more of the share. Well, what's what are, are the big three expenses if this field is already established as hay, seed, and fertilizer, chemicals, Sometimes you spray it, but sometimes you throw a little nitrogen out there. A little bit of nitrogen this past year was 50 bucks an acre because fertilizer prices were so high. So the landlord's share of the income minus their share of the expenses, that's another way to set the cash rent. Which one's a better deal? Well, it depends how much it yielded, right? So you gotta play with that trade-off. I like these numbers, I like these ways to work through this because if you can tell me, most people can come up with some ideas on prices, and I hope as an operator, some of them are starting to think about pre-pricing expenses now, so they'll at least have some ideas. Are they higher, are they kind of constant, whatever. And you can kind of build off of that. The final example, as I said, this is a little bit harder because you gotta know what, you, what it's worth and what the current rate of return is. Is the rate of return on land very high or low? It's low, right? Is your rate of return on your checking account very high or low? Well, is zero low? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, very small number. Can you overfeed land? Can you kill it? There's only three ways to lose land in your lifetime. Teach this to your grandkids. Death, debt, and divorce. That's it. The three Ds of life, right? Now, you can also gain more land through marriage than you can lose, right? So keep that in mind too when you look for your perspective. <laughs> um, if you know what the land's worth, and you times it by the rate of return, there's actually a table inside the real estate report, it's table five. Irrigated cropland in eastern Nebraska, you're talking a little less than 3%. Dry land cropland in the mid twos, grazing land, the rate of return is probably a little bit below two. So that's where the rate of return is. We had an asset that rapidly appreciated, with that rapid appreciation in that asset, the rate of return is quite low. Asset value times the rate of return gives us our return or our potential rental rate. Now, if you're sitting in your chair thinking, well, I want a 3% return and I think my ground's worth 16,500 an acre. Well, if you think it's worth that, the rate of return probably isn't 3%. Maybe it's only a, you know, a half a percent or something. That's why you gotta be very careful playing around with these things. Okay. All right, so I went through three examples, or I guess three examples, but four slides on how do we set cash rents. What do we have for questions? You notice we save the numbers until after lunch, right? <laughs> if you are negotiating cash rents right now, if you're on a custom share deal and you'd like to convert it over to a cash rent, you got a little bit of homework to do. You can get owner expenses um, from the UNL crop budgets. Glennis McClure is down on campus, very nice person. I bet if she hasn't posted them yet, they'll be posted in the next six to eight weeks for the 2023 crop budgets. Uh, just give her a call. She loves to talk to people, great person. She's a lot nicer than Alan and I are. Give her a call and try to find a budget that's somewhat similar to what you have. And from that, that's where you can figure out some of these numbers, okay? I don't know what the price of corn is. I don't know what the price of crude oil is gonna do next week yet a year from now. You could draw up scenarios. Maybe 590 is what you expect. Maybe your high end six and a half and maybe your low end is four and a half, whatever. You can play the what if scenarios with these and keep plugging away as long as you want. 
Uh, this slide just documents the final approach to estimating rate of return on land. Just be very careful if you play with those numbers, what you plug in. I'm going to start queuing Alan up for his section here. We'll talk briefly on some trends that we're seeing in lease arrangements across Nebraska. First thing, I know if you have a black and white copy, this is not the easiest to see, but when we print in color, about triples our expenses for printing. That's why most of the handouts are in black and white. Let me explain what we have here and see what you can draw from it from your, where you're seated. If you see a bar up here in blue, we asked the people that took our survey in your area of the state, the eight different regions going across the bottom, we grouped them into the west, central, and to the far right to the east. What do you estimate in your area, what percent of the leases that you're aware of are crop share, cash lease, or cash lease with a flexible lease provision, which is a form of a cash lease? What do you notice? The regions in the western part of the state tend to have more of this blue, which is crop share. The regions in the eastern part of the state, especially the northeast, heavier row crop areas, more so than maybe the western part where you have a lot more grazing land, you tend to see either a lot more cash leases, and overall you see those flex leases, which are basically a cash lease, they're somewhere between five to 10% roughly of what we see for leases across the state, okay? Why do we see more crop share in western Nebraska in certain areas than we do in the eastern part? Any ideas? Hail. I drove in it with my old car yesterday. It's a lot more risky. It can get a lot more drier. Every, what is it, every 25 or 30 mi five miles you move northwest in this state, you lose an inch of rain. And when you get into those areas, you get hail, you got insect issues. Maybe it doesn't rain very much at all when you need it to rain, it gets more risky. And that's why we see people wanting to share in the risk associated with raising those crops. Eastern part of the state, it tends to rain fairly favorably. Uh, maybe a little bit more irrigated cropland leases in areas. And if it's a little bit less risky, maybe they just want the cash rent or maybe the tenants want to offer the cash rent. People that take our report, we also asked them on this topic of flex leases, which last year we did a workshop series on flex leases. We asked them, the basics on a flex lease, with a flex lease, we will let the cash rent within a range vary based on some factor of risk, okay? So say for example, I wanna pay 200 bucks, Alan wants 250, Maybe we start the lease off at 225, and based on some factor, we're gonna let that cash rent vary within this range. Those factors are up on the screen right now. A little over a third of the people that do flex leases either focus on crop price, or a little over 40% focus on crop revenue. When we think about risk associated with crop production, what are most dry land people worried about? Yes, they're worried about price, but they're really worried about yield, right? Now, if you're an irrigated operation, assuming you have plenty of water, decent ground, what is maybe the biggest thing you're worried about? Price. The reason I like to put price and yield together is just because you have a good yield doesn't mean you have a good price, and just because you have a good price doesn't mean you have a good yield, right? So this is a little bit deceiving on how you say this, but overall people are either, they're looking at that price component or that price and yield component together as revenue, right? Um, when it comes to that price component, when we talk about price, what do you mean price? There are different prices associated with crops. Are you talking the cash price, the, the local spot price? About half the people use the local spot price. A uh, little, not quite 25% use what is called the crop insurance planting and harvesting time price guarantees. Those are an average associated with the futures price. The main thing that people are trying to capture is do you have a change between what you initially expect when the crop got planted versus what actually happens when it's harvested? Okay, 